Anthropology, that which includes paleoanthropology, is a field well known for its turbulent nature, and many discoveries and hypotheses have been known in the past to often turn over a great deal of what we know, leading to a constantly shifting study of our ancestors and their evolution. A prime example of this comes in the form of an hypothesis that has continued to linger in anthropology circles, and is one of the more controversial hypotheses that has arisen in the field, that being the controversial aquatic ape hypothesis. Since the hypothesis was first suggested in 1960 by marine biologist Alistair Hardy, there has been a great deal of controversy over the hypothesis, with a great many players involved that have made the theory a continuously discussed topic. In essence, the hypothesis states that a great many adaptations that humans possess seem at one point to have been useful for an aquatic lifestyle, indicating that at some point in the past, our ancestors spent a significant part of their lives in water, eventually returning to land and becoming terrestrial in the process. A great amount of features that were presented as evidence as aquatic adaptations by Hardy included our ability in the water and our enjoyment of it, loss of significant body hair, flexible backbones, a layer of fat under the skin, as well as suggesting that the ability to walk upright came about through wading, with the water helping to support body weight. The seemingly impressive range of characteristics appears sufficient evidence to support the hypothesis, and it does seem to be a tantalising and thought-provoking idea but through a closer look at the evidence, it reveals a more complex story than what you would initially realise. The aquatic ape hypothesis, while being supported by some, is disregarded by many anthropologists, simply that much of the proposed evidence for a previously aquatic lifestyle can be explained in other ways, and that the adaptations for an aquatic lifestyle are also useful for a terrestrial one, and in many aspects, more so. The hypothesis came around in order to give a potential explanation to features that appear to indicate an aquatic ancestry, although with more information that has been discovered and realised over the years, many biological aspects of the aquatic ape hypothesis have been refuted as being of an aquatic origin, and instead correlates towards a terrestrial habitat. The hypothesis sets out to provide an explanation towards our seemingly unique features, such as, why do humans lack sufficient fur? The aquatic ape hypothesis explains this feature as being useful for moving through the water more easily, and therefore making the body more streamlined and hydrodynamic, noting the similarities to known aquatic mammals like manatees, whales and hippos. As well as this, sweating and or crying is also explained as being able to remove large amounts of salt from the body when swimming in oceanic environments and that babies are seemingly able to swim and practice proper breathing control when placed in water. A great deal more biological adaptations have also been shown to have some aquatic viability, but to keep it more concise, most of the adaptations proposed happen to coincide to the main point of the hypothesis, that at a point in our evolutionary history, we as Homo sapiens might have gone through an aquatic phase. The aquatic ape hypothesis for these reasons has been appealing to a great many people, but there are most definitely flaws with it, and features that are presented as being for an aquatic nature are either over-exaggerated, misinterpreted, or inaccurate. So-called aquatic adaptations, while indeed useful in water, also correlate to a terrestrial lifestyle, as one trait can be useful for multiple things. All the suggested anatomical and physiological adaptations can be explained sufficiently by other hypotheses, which themselves fit better with what we know about the ecology of ancient hominins. Hairlessness, for instance, is only most commonplace on fully aquatic mammals such as whales and dolphins. Other aquatic animals also possess fur, and are still able to move effectively in water, that which includes otters, seals, and beavers, and in the case of our fat deposits pattern that appears to suggest an adaptation for aquatic life, this pattern is also found in many other terrestrial animals, including hedgehogs, badgers, and some other primates. Whales and dolphins, while lacking body hair, also possess blubber, allowing them to maintain a steady temperature in the most frigid of waters, something that humans lack, and therefore are susceptible to hypothermia, as we are lightly built, even among primates. Sexual selection and adaptations to heat loss better explain our pattern of body hair and fat distribution, with smaller hairs being more useful in dissipating heat off of the body. As well as this, the smaller hairs assist in reducing parasite infestations, and these explanations more than explain a reduction in hair length and thickness. 
Another adaptation thought to be brought about by an aquatic lifestyle is the increase in brain size through an increased consumption of omega-3, which is present at high concentrations in fish, but this too can be explained through other means. The skull of Homo sapiens is actually an example of neoteny, wherein an organism possesses traits in their adult stage that resemble juvenile traits in other species. As an example, we have relatively flat faces, no sagittal crest to anchor large muscles or enlarged canines. In many respects, we look more like juvenile chimpanzees than mature primates. This change in skull structure is down to changes in social structure throughout our evolution, in that a large sagittal crest is utilised to maintain order amongst a group, which in primates like gorillas allows them to bite down more powerfully with their enlarged canines, to ensure singular dominance over a group. The diminished sagittal crest noted in hominins indicates that over time, singular dominance over a group became less favourable. Instead, it appears that it was more beneficial to work together in a group, and that there was less and less need for an alpha male to take dominance. This meant that sagittal crested individuals were gradually phased out over time, as the need for such structures was no longer necessary in an evolutionary sense. From there, as hominins began to become more cooperative and social, it meant for enhanced communication and social behaviours, allowing for greater strategy and learning, and with the diminishing of large zygomatic arches and sagittal crests, it meant that more room was present for larger brains, which continued to be selected for, as the skulls became lighter for easier mobility, as well as being fuelled by cooked meat, a result of the taming of fire, which became possible through increased brain size and therefore understanding of their world, resulting in a positive feedback loop where beneficial elements continue to benefit one another. This also means that humans have an extended juvenile stage where our brain continues to develop until our 20s, being able to retain skills and information more easily. And because groups of hominins were becoming more social, it meant that these individuals were better able to survive to adulthood and pass on their knowledge and genes. But what about the webbing between our fingers? Would that not be in some way show an adaptation for aquatic life? Well, yes. The small amount of webbing does allow for the easier scooping of water to better propel ourselves, but this adaptation is secondarily useful for this task, and was not selected for this specific reason. The webbing allows for a greater surface area when grasping objects, and allows for the thumb to spread further from the other fingers for increased flexibility and range, which is found in other primates as well. The evolution of bipedalism in a terrestrial habitat is explained by the aquatic ape hypothesis to be unlikely, as bipedalism isn't more efficient than quadrupedalism in the case of chimpanzees, except in the more derived Homo sapiens, and that water allowed for a bipedal posture to be better supported, although the evolution of bipedalism is not related to an aquatic lifestyle. Rodents like gerbils and jaboas move bipedally, as do kangaroos, which also evolved in grassland environments, and none of these animals evolved bipedalism through an aquatic ancestor. Bipedalism in humans not only allowed for greater visibility in grasslands, but also made us appear larger to predators, and coupled with a larger group size, allowed for an increase in intimidation, as well as allowing our hands to be freed for tool use, a step that would be critical in our evolution. Bipedalism has also been observed in other apes, which is most commonly associated with wading through water, a key point that supporters of the theory point out, but apes also walk on two legs when reaching for food, performing aggressive displays, or simply moving around trees. Although these arguments are interesting and do provide some discussion, the main problem with all of these suggestions is timing, as all of these adaptations mentioned developed at very different times in human evolution, meaning that populations would have had to have remained semi-aquatic for thousands if not millions of years, which does not match up well with the fossil record. If we evolved from ancestors that evolved in the trees from what the fossil records suggests, then there is no need for an extraordinary explanation as to how we began to stand bipedally on the ground. The hypothesis also explains how the body plan of humans is ideal for swimming due to our physique and curvy bodies, although humans, even the most capable of us, are poor swimmers when compared to other aquatic animals. The placement of our musculature is not beneficial for swimming, and fits more with terrestrial animals, and our musculature is remarkably weak compared to a vast majority of animals, especially marine mammals which have to navigate through a viscous medium, and have therefore developed stronger muscles to compensate, whereas humans are lightly built. 
Like most apes, humans do not naturally know how to swim, and even in the case of babies being able to swim, babies cannot actually swim sufficiently, as they lack the strength and body features to last long on their own, and their reflexes and instinct give the impression to make it look like they are. Babies are also not able to hold their breath intentionally, and aren't typically strong enough to keep their head above water. The mammalian dive reflex that is also exhibited, where the heart rate slows and blood is diverted away from the extremities, is also present in other mammals as well, and is not entirely unique to humans. Humans can learn to swim well with proper training, but if we were semi-aquatic for long enough for it to have a significant effect on our anatomy, wouldn't we be better at it? Humans drown often, and many individuals lack the capability to do so, often down to our downward-facing nostrils that while can prevent water from entering the lungs while diving, is more of a hindrance while swimming. We also lack the adaptations to stay submerged for extended periods of time, and pale in comparison to the efficiency and power of known aquatic animals. This fits well with other primates, as most are poor swimmers, and often avoid water if absolutely necessary, which is inconsistent with an aquatic ancestor that is suggested to have existed. Our kidneys have been mentioned at points to allow us to process seawater, although this is often fatal through dehydration, and humans can only survive typically for three days without any fresh water. Marine mammals get their water from food, and others do possess kidney modifications that allow them to process seawater. Other aquatic animals like birds and reptiles also have salt glands around the face, which exist to remove salt from the blood. Our tears and sweat are only salty because our body fluids naturally contain salts, and these salts are necessary for many bodily functions including neural activity, and doesn't necessarily correlate towards an aquatic habitat. The salt in our tears and sweat is at the same concentration as our blood, and only tastes salty because we already have taste buds specifically designed to identify and taste salty foods. Despite having clearing up most of these proposed adaptations, it is not to say that wading and feeding near the coast was something we as Homo sapiens avoided or outright didn't do, as these water sources do hold critical food and development advantages, but it was not the direct drive of our evolution. As years have passed, many of the once unknown gaps in the fossil record of hominins have been filled, which spanning at least over 7 million years should change in both hominid biology and behaviour, all of which being discovered without a single trace of a theorised aquatic ancestor. While late in our evolution, we did start to exploit tidal resources, yet there is no evidence to our spending more time in water, and it is not indicative that we were in any way sufficient semi-aquatic organisms. Traits such as habitual bipedalism, large cranium size, and speech didn't all evolve at once through a singular selection pressure, and instead their emergence is spread over millions of years. The human body through its unique development is supremely adaptable, and features that are advantageous for a terrestrial lifestyle also became beneficial for other tasks, which with our social nature and willingness to cooperate, meant that Homo sapiens could more easily access other environments through our versatile anatomy, allowing such environments to be more easily colonised and explored. One of the characteristics of parsimony, where in this case an aspect of behaviour should be interpreted at its most simple level, is the ability of a hypothesis to link many different effects with a single cause, which under this definition makes the aquatic ape hypothesis very appealing. The hypothesis is simple and elegant, so that it can thoroughly explain differences between great apes and humans, as for example, we think of fish as hairless and oily, and humans are practically hairless and oily too. Therefore, they're both adapted for swimming, appearing logical and convincing in the process. The hypothesis is able to link many different characteristics to a single cause that would not appear to be tightly linked to each other, in this case, the various aspects of human biology. It's approachable, tidy, and comprehensible, hence why it is popular with the lay public and not with scientists. One might propose that the features that were originally adapted in an aquatic environment became useful when formerly aquatic apes moved onto land, but each of these features would still require an adaptive explanation as to why they would be maintained, and each of these explanations would need to be equally credible to explain the origin of these characteristics outside an aquatic environment. In other words, the aquatic ape hypothesis explains the features, but explains them all twice, as all the features need to have a reason to still be maintained, leaving the hypothesis explaining nothing in the process, and therefore not being easy to support or back up. 
The hypothesis is simply too extravagant and at the same time too simple, having becoming more and more elastic as time goes on, with any and all proponents seizing hold of any mention of water, fish or wading in human evolution discussion, as well as explaining how fossils of hominids found near river sediments imply reliance on aquatic habitat. Hypotheses should always be built on and tested against established evidence, that's being fossils, comparative anatomy, physiology and genetics. And in every aspect, the aquatic ape hypothesis has continued to fall short to match said evidence. The evolutionary history of hominids has continued to become more complicated and complex as the years pass, and all of the hypotheses that have been created and researched upon all further grew our understanding of this fascinating time period, that which includes the aquatic ape theory, even if little of it contains valid and accurate information. And with that, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you would like to see more, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time, whenever that may be.